everyone. I wanted to take this week to talk about the archaeology of pandemics and the coming of quarantine. So, my name's Lauren. I'm an anthropology and archaeology student at McMaster University, and for this summer, I am the history museum interpreter at the Museum of Ontario Archaeology. Um, yeah, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so, archaeology is a unique discipline. It's very uniquely situated um, to talk about the origins of quarantine and the archaeology of pandemics. Um, it has the ability to inform us not only of past diseases, uh, the who, what, when, where, and why of them, but additionally we can talk about the human experience of them and how various civilizations have managed disease outbreaks in the past. Um, so this leads me to one of the big questions um, for this pandemic, um, what will future archaeologists see? What will this pandemic leave behind? Because eventually, um, the current pandemic will fade into the past, even if now that seems almost unimaginable. We are lucky enough that we have the ability to look at the past to help us answer these questions. Um, so before we dive in, I thought it was important to explain a few key terms. Um, so an epidemic specifically is the widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time, while a pandemic is an epidemic of infectious disease that is spread across a large region. This can be multiple continents or it can be worldwide as we're seeing right now. Um, and this, these, comes, these terms are from, have key roots in them. So ep means one, pan means all, and demos means people. So one people and versus all people. Um, another term is the uh, definition I should explain is a zoonotic disease. Um, so a zoonotic disease is a disease that can spread from animals to people. Um, it's actually the majority of all human infectious, infectious diseases and pandemics have originated through this cross species transmissions. Uh, so this includes the bubonic plague, brucellosis, Ebola, and, as well as COVID-19. Um, it's worth mentioning that humanity's relationship with zoonotic diseases is extremely old. Um, it began even before we started living in close proximity with animals, which began as a result of animal domestication. Heather actually discusses animal d domestication in a previous live talk, which is an excellent reference um, if you'd like to know more about that. Um, so the first zoonotic disease can be observed in a skeleton from about 2.8 million years ago in one of our oldest predecessors, uh, Australopithecus africanus. So Australopithecus africanus is a species who walked the earth some 3 to 2.8 million years ago. Um, it is thought to be a direct ancestor of modern humans. So the individual studied uh, probably an adult male is presumed to have contracted brucellosis from consuming the meat of an infected animal. The disease is a, is a bacterial infection that most commonly affects the spinal joints causing bone degradation and lesions. Archaeologists study the specimen's bone lesions microscopically which allowed them to diagnose the, this condition which was originally assumed to be the result of a spinal injury. This type of research is called paleopathology and it is the study of disease in human remains and is an offshoot of bioarchaeology. But this is just one of the ways we can study disease because as a result of our long standing history with infectious diseases, they can be seen in the archeological and historical record in a multitude of ways. Um, so burial context, molecular data and written records where they are available are all used in archeological study as well. So the first widespread infectious diseases that were recognized archaeologically occurred in the Neolithic period, which began about 12,000 years ago, when small hunter-gatherer groups moved towards more sedentary life. So we went from being mobile, moving all around, to moving in, living in small villages, camps, that sort of thing. Um, so the first permanent large settlements and their tra transition to urban urbanization increased the numbers of people living at close quarters with one another and with their newly domesticated animals. So the first zoonotic disease occurred about 2.8 million years ago. The first widespread disease dispersion, what we, we would now call an epidemic, did not occur until around 10,000 years ago, while what is widely accepted as the first pandemic did not occur until approximately 2,500 years ago. Um, this large time gap is because pandemics and epidemics have are occurrences that have not always been possible or at least considerably less probable. 
um, because social circles were very small and human contact was limited. Um, travel was limited to the distance one could walk at one point. Um, so as humanity marched towards modernity, the possibility for pandemics has only increased. One of the most significant and dangerous changes in human behavior was the rise in demand for exotic goods, um, causing trade networks between urban cities to flourish. Trade became increasingly frequent and widespread, augmenting the possibility of contracting and spreading illness. This was essentially the change in human behavior that allowed small sickness outbreaks to turn into epidemics, which could then turn into pandemics. Uh, living in the extremely globalized world we do today, it's easy to see how COVID-19 was able to spread so quickly and as widely as it has. Um, so archeology span is revealing that disease is something humans both modern and archaic have dealt with and been able to overcome for millions of years um, and exacerbated with the move towards modernity. It seems that disease has always been and will always be somewhat of a certainty for humanity. So now we've looked at how archaeological study can reveal disease. Um, we can now sort of examine how it reveals past people's response to disease. Um, so specifically ancient masks. The earliest known masks were discovered in the Mil Middle East and are approximately, approximately 9,000 years old. That said, these are the earliest known masks. Masks could have, would have been used long before this, but are not preserved in the archeological record. Um, because these masks are made of stone, they allow, it allows for excellent preservation, um, but rarely is this a material of choice for a mask it's because it is heavy, difficult to wear and craft. Um, and these masks were actually used probably in some type of ritual contest and did not serve a medicinal purpose, or at least how we would think of medicine nowadays, especially in the Western world. Uh, it seems likely that these, um, oh, sorry. Um, an example of an early mask designed strictly for medicinal purposes is the plague mask of the 17th and 18th centuries. So these were designed and developed in 1630. The invention then spread throughout Europe in order to cope with the Black Death or bubonic plague. Um, so these were worn by doctors only and the masks were just one small part, although an extremely recognizable part of the outfits that plague doctors wore when dealing with patients presumed to be infected. Um, so the beaks, the part that comes extends from the face, um, were stuffed with herbs, spices, and perfumes that reduced the smell and were thought to purify the air. And it's this purification that was thought to keep the disease at bay. And it also helped to um, prevent the smell that was often associated with the infected. Um, face masks as they are used today in healthcare and in the community can be largely traced back historically to a more recent period when a new understanding of infection based on germ theory was applied to, to surgery. So, from the 1960s to the 1980s, medical professionals and scientists were theorizing about bacteria and how infection was spread. This developed understanding of bacteria dispersion led to the rise of the modern mask. So these masks were used only in the operating room at first. It was during the Manchurian Plague of 1910 and 1911 and the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919 um, that turned the face mask into a means of protecting medical workers and patients from infectious diseases outside of the operating room. Um, and masks were not the only way people of the past were coping with, with disease outbreaks. Uh, beginning in the 14th century, quarantine was used in order to contain the bubonic plague which is also known as the Black Death, um, a zoonotic disease con contracted from fleas that were carried by rats. So the city of Venice was largely responsible for popularizing quarantine as a way to deal with the Black Death in Europe. Other cities followed suit, um, installing strict quarantine regulations. And Venice is actually where the word quarantine originates from. So Venice forced people to isolate for 40 days or a, a quarantino, which meant a period of 40 days. Um, and I should mention that the city did not invent quarantine, it merely organized it and popularized it. The concept of isolating the sick has existed at least since biblical times. Um, so quarantine, among other me measures taken to protect the health of the public, was an extremely advanced response to the outbreak of the plague. Archaeological research is illuminating how the city created a vast public health response more than almost 700 years ago and helps lay the modern foundation for coping with pandemics.
So the Black Death struck the city of Venice a number of times. The city was especially vulnerable because it was a trading center. Um, an especially large episode occurred in the 14th century, killing approximately a third of the population of Italy and a quarter of the population of Europe by the time it had run its course. So the Venetian government became the first in the Mediterranean region to systematically use large-scale methods of isolation and information collecting to monitor and fight infectious diseases. This was an extremely impre impressive feat as there was no germ theory and wouldn't be for at least another 400 years to explain how and why the disease spread. Um, so this includes they didn't know how long the incubation period, so once you were exposed, this is why they erred on the side of caution using 40 days. Um, to ensure that that person wasn't sick or had the ability to spread the disease. Um, so, in response to the disastrous effects of the Black Death, Venice established quarantine islands in order to isolate the sick. The sick and symptomatic were transported to an island called Lazaretto Vecchio, separated, um, so they were separated from the healthy by more than five kilometers of ocean, protecting the public from further spread. Um, so, Lazaretto Vecchio and Lazaretto Nuovo are islands located in the Venetian lagoon that were used to quarantine and treat the sick beginning in the 14th century and enduring until the 17th century. These islands were not temporarily used, just as quarantine was not a temporary response to disaster. Rather, the initiative installed by Venice was a permanent governed-run continuous monitoring effort that endured until military general Napoleon Bonaparte co um, conquested the um, that area, um, and this was about in 1797, I believe. Um, and this approach was necessary because, as I mentioned earlier, the bubonic plague swept Europe repeatedly over the centuries. Um, each time it was devastating. So archaeologists are still excavating these islands, bringing new understanding to the pandemic and other epidemics that struck the city. Excavations are primarily focused on Lazaretto Nuovo, which was a place of precautionary quarantine. So this means that incoming ships, for example, were told to dock and unload there. They were then searched um, in order to air out and clean the cargo using seawater or vinegar, which was thought to decrease the risk of disease transmission from the incoming goods. Um, if all was clear, they were, the ships were then allowed to continue to one of the main harbors in Venice. If it wasn't, they were forced to quarantine on the island until all signs of sickness were gone. Um, Lazaretto Nuovo had a warehouse for contaminated goods, and both islands had plague, plague hospitals, also called isolation hospitals. So archaeologically, we see all this evidence for quarantine as well as its effectiveness. So isolation worked both to contain the sickness as well as raise public morale. Um, it was realized that the government was taking action to protect the people, and there was hope installed because there was a not a solution in place, but a visibly effective plan to deal with this issue. Um, and it's actually widely accepted that the plague was ended largely because of quarantine, which I think speaks to its importance today as well. Um, so now, today, the remains of mass graves and plague hospitals located on the islands are studied by archaeologists. Since 2004, archaeologists have unearthed more than 1,500 skeletons of plague victims buried between the 14th and 17th centuries on Lazaretto Vecchio alone. These have been found in individual as well as in mass graves, and the remains of thousands more are expected still to be found on the small island as the death toll reportedly reached almost 500 per day in the 16th century during one of the peaks. Um, so I mentioned earlier the various ways in which archaeologists can identify victims of disease. These victims were identified based on burial context because the Black Death killed too quickly to leave any visible diagnostic skeletal lesions, um, thereby preventing pathological diagnosis of the disease. So the study of the mass graves has revealed that sickness, sicknesses swept through the city in waves as graves were dug and redug in order to inhume more bodies. So this type of study has allowed archaeologists to estimate the times at which the plague peaked and quelled. Um, Bioarchaeological study of the graves has revealed that social economic status did not make a difference once an individual had contracted the disease or was exposed to it. So poor, middle class, and wealthy people all died as a result of contracting the plague. Um, and this is based on skeletal remains, so diet can actually be determined and socio socioeconomic status inferred. 
um, because essentially the rich have healthier skeletons, especially at this time, because they could afford more food, they had a, um, a much wider variation in diet and could afford meat. Um, so we can see this skeletally. So many years later in the 19th century, Halifax, Nova Scotia implemented a similar coping strategy as outbreaks of cholera, typhus, smallpox, and the plague ran rampant through the city as a result of trade. Um, one of the first quarantine islands in Canada was called McNabb's Islands. So this came to be a quarantine island because a ship containing a few hundred people immigrating from Ireland in 1866 had an outbreak of cholera. They needed some place to go um, when signs of sickness were reported. So the ship was then forced to dock at this island just off the coast of Halifax. Um, so many of the individu individuals aboard never reached Halifax Harbor and died aboard the ship or on the island where they were then buried in a mass grave. In the same year, a quarantine building was constructed and dismantled, which you can kind of see the remains of today. Um, but in fact, McNabb stopped being used altogether as a quarantine island when a young girl contracted cholera just a few short months after this ship had arrived at the island. Um, no one could understand how she became ill with cholera when those infected were kept on an island and had never actually reached the city itself. It was later discovered that her mother had used a piece of canvas um, washed up on shore to make the young girl a petticoat. So the cloth had been on the contaminated ship was tossed overboard, um, bringing the disease to the shore. So Halifax's designated quarantine island was then moved further away from the city shores as evidently using McNabb's posed too great a risk. So Gross Eel, a quarantine island located in the St. Lawrence River, is yet another example of Venice's quarantine, an isolation model that influenced modern government response to disease outbreak. Um, so this island was used as a precautionary quarantine island for ships coming from Europe, much like Lazaretto Nuovo was. So this island was the site of an immigration depot, which predominantly housed Irish immigrants coming to Canada to escape the Great Famine, which was from 1845 to 1849. Um, in 1832, the Lower Canadian government had previously set up this depot to contain an earlier cholera epidemic that was believed to be caused by the large influx of European immigrants. And then the station was reopened in the mid 19th century to accommodate Irish migrants who had contracted typhus during their voyages. So thousands of Irish were quarantined on the island from 1832 until 1848. It is believed that over 3,000 Irish died on the island and over 5,000 are currently buried in the cemetery, in the cemetery there um, because many died en route. Most who died on the island were infected with typhi typhus, which sprang up from the conditions there in 1847. So Gross Eel is the largest burial ground for refuge refugees of the Great Famine outside of Ireland. Um, it is believed that more than 500,000 immigrants passed through it on their way to Canada. So to wrap up, um, archaeology is revealing that past experiences echo many current ones. There is a tendency to dispel views of past epidemics as historical curiosities, um, completely disconnected from circumstances that exist today. Um, when really what we should be doing is emphasizing that the current and future interactions between humans and infectious diseases are merely a continuation of a struggle that our ancestors faced in the past. Um, so for example, in Venice, despite the difference of several hundred years, quarantine was laying the foundation for quarantine today. We see similar public health policies implemented, similar economical and political repercussions, and similar hu human experiences voiced. Um, the economy suffered as a result of the plague, as ours does today. Venice's economy was especially um, vulnerable because they were primarily a city for trading, and trade was halted as a result of the outbreak, and, outbreak, and the industry essentially collapsed on them. Um, there was a huge political response, and social restru restructuring occurred. Um, in Venice, many of the, the elite lost their status post-quarantine, um, because new voices, specifically those of the poor, were being heard. Um, we can see similar similarities today as political re leaders are either praised or reprimanded for how they choose to handle the challenges associated with the pandemic. And I think it will be reflected in the upcoming elections. We can see that people during the plague were doing their best to manage the outbreak and protect the city. Um, at the time, doctors, volunteers, various military personnel,
risk their lives to protect the health and safety of their city and their people in much the same way that our frontline workers do today. Um, and now I think better than ever we can understand the anxiety felt. Many people today echo the voices of the past as once again isolation is implemented, um, families are separated causing people to feel scared and uncertain. To summarize it was a very similar disruption of life. Um, yeah, that's basically all I have for today. If you'd like to know more, I'll add some links to articles in the comments and please feel, please feel free to ask questions in the comments as well. Thank you for watching.